I have a question for you. And this question may be uncomfortable for some of you, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If you died unexpectedly today, would your family know where to find your will and trust document? How about your financial accounts? Your insurance policies? Pins and passwords to your online accounts? And how about family stories or heirlooms and their location? And is it all organized into one space? If your answer is, I don't know, or no, then you really can benefit, you and your family can benefit from creating the family legacy drawer. Now, the family legacy drawer is where you put information your family is going to need in, to carry on in your absence. It's a way to say, I love you to your family, to the family members that you leave behind. Preparing for when you're no longer here seems to be a task that we all put off. But it's crucial to do this for your family. Every household needs one. It doesn't matter whether you're young and single with no kids or if you're a 75-year-old grandmother with 10 grandchildren. It is the last gift you will leave your family. And if you truly care about your loved ones, you will take the time to create this family legacy drawer. It truly is the best gift you can give your family. Now this drawer should contain everything you or your spouse or your family needs to know when you're no longer around. And this is whether through death or incapacity. And the reason I say incapacity is because of this story. There was a woman who entered a long-term nursing facility because of a severe stroke. Her family spent days going through her files and papers, making endless phone calls, trying to locate basic information about her life, long-term care, care and health insurance policies, trying to discern her assets and liabilities, and determining if she'd even filed her income tax returns. Even after going through this agonizing process, the family didn't know for sure if they found everything. Now, the family legacy drawer would have greatly minimized this lingering worry. So I want to give you three specific benefits of having the financial legacy drawer. And you all should have gotten a handout there. And um, also, I'm going to give you a list of 12 items that you might want to include in your family legacy drawer. Now, please fill in the blanks, because research tells us that we learn more and retain more when we write it down. So what are the benefits of the family legacy drawer? Number one, it spares extra grief. Losing a loved one is tough enough on the family. Sadly, the pain, the stress, the aggravation, family quarrels, and lost time that resorts from poor planning and organization really only multiplies the pain. Creating the family legacy drawer will communicate your wishes to your family, and it will lay out a road map of, of the steps that you want them to take. Compiling this inf information now will not only simplify things for your family, but it clearly expresses how much you love them. Number two, it saves money. Attorneys, accountants, financial advisors charge thousands of dollars to organize our estates when we die. And part of these expenses are simply tracking down records of what we own, what we owe, who's in charge, and who should receive our property. By having the legacy drawer in place, you can save a portion of the money because you won't have to pay advisors for hours and hours of waiting through your records. And then number three, it provides a good foundation. It, cre it creates clarity and organization. Your family will be able to locate important documents, wrap up your estate, and carry on the legacy that you have created. Now this drawer can be a physical drawer, like a file drawer or a three-wing binder and contain paper documents, or it can be virtual on your computer with digital documents, or a combination of both. And so now I'm going to cover the 12 items that, um, just basic items that you may want to put in your family legacy drawer. The first one there is the cover letter and a table of contents. Cover letter, table of contents. And really the cover letter is just a simple letter to explain to your family What's, what the purpose of the drawer is, and quickly what's in it. 
And then the table of contents actually will make it easy for your family to see all the documents in, in one view, all the documents that are in there. And it acts as a guide to navigate uh, your family through the drawer. Number two are your will and trust documents. And let's first briefly cover how a will works. A will is the simplest legal document you can use to leave your property to others after death. In it, you name the executor, you'll name a guardian to any minor children you might have, and then your beneficiaries. Property left by a will must usually go through probate court proceedings, and that really can be time consuming and expensive. A revocable living trust allows property to quickly and efficiently pass to your beneficiaries you name without the trouble and expense of probate court proceedings. Basically, you're creating a declaration of trust, you name yourself as the trustee, and then you transfer the ownership of the property in the name of the trust. However, you don't give up any control of your property while you're still alive. You name a successor trustee, who will transfer the property to your beneficiaries at your death. Now, when someone dies without a will or trust, state law is going to determine the who receives the deceased person's property. And a court is going to determine who will be the uh, guardian of the minor children. And often, the state and the courts are going to make very different decisions than you would have made. So this is an extremely important part of your family legacy drawer. Settling an estate without a will or trust, like I said, is costly and time consuming. The laws are complicated and they're different for every state. So if you do not have any of these legal documents, I strongly urge you to consult an estate planning attorney and determine which best fits your life situation. And this should be the first thing at the bottom of your little handout because I have a little action items. So if you don't have that, put that there. Number three is your net worth statement, listing of financial accounts. That's net worth statement and listing of financial accounts. Now the net worth statement essentially lists all your assets and all your liabilities. And be sure to you know, list all of your financial accounts, your bank accounts, brokerage, you've got pensions, annuities, IRAs, 401ks, just to name a few. Also list there your personal property, your cars, art, antiques, collectibles, jewelry. And also list your real estate holdings and any notes receivable. And then list your liabilities. So that would be like your mortgage, car loans, student loans, credit card bills, and any other debts that you have. And you know, making this list of your financial accounts really has many benefits. One of them is just for you. Because when you list and review the accounts, you may find that you want to simplify your financial life, maybe even consolidate things or diversify. You may even want to change beneficiary designations to go along with your estate plan. And then number four, all insurance information. List each insurance policy that you own or that covers you and your property. This may include policies for life, health, disability, your home and its contents, vehicles, liability, even long-term care insurance. And be sure to include sometimes less typical items. I mean, maybe you have death benefits through your place of employment or union. Make sure that you list those. I have a story about this. Uh, years ago, there was a client who carried a significant life insurance policy. The premium was paid automatically from his bank account. The policy itself was lost in a clutter of papers, but the automatic debit of the premium kept the policy alive. When the, bank, when the man no longer was able to handle his own affairs, his children moved him to the city of one of his sons and closed the bank account in his previous hometown. The children had no idea that they inadvertently had terminated, for non-payment, a significant life insurance policy on their father until after he died. If this had been documented in the family legacy drawer, they might have received over half a million dollars in life insurance proceeds. 
Number five, important documents or their location. Important documents or their location. List out each document and where they can be found. And these documents are things like birth certificates, passports, social security cards, deeds to your property. Some people choose to store these types of documents in their homes in a fireproof and waterproof safe. That's where I keep mine. And others consider a safe deposit box as the safest place to store these types of documents. And so that's going to lead us into number six, which is safe deposit box content listing. How many here have a safe deposit box? Are there? OK, there are a few. OK. Wasn't, I wasn't sure how popular that was. I just want to go over some things that you should put in a safe deposit box. Then there are items that you should not put in a safe deposit box. So good things to keep in your safe deposit box would be originals of your birth and marriage certificates, uh, any stock and bond certificates that you might have, uh, deeds to your real estate, uh, the pink slip, like the titles to your vehicles, and maybe even some expensive jewelry that you don't wear all the time. Some items that you don't want to put in a safe deposit box would be your original will or trust document. Don't want to put in there any medical or financial power of attorney. Not your life insurance policies. Nor your financial wishes and burial instructions. And I have a story to relate to this. An organized and thoughtful woman worked diligently pulling together information that her loved ones would need when she died. She carefully wrote out her wishes, she secured burial arrangements, gathered documents, and stored all of the papers in her safe deposit box. She taped her spare safe deposit box key to an index card and carefully wrote the number of the safe deposit box on the card. She informed her grown children and she stored the index card conveniently in the top drawer of her desk. When she died, her children met at her home. They retrieved the index card from her desk. Only then did they realize that she had neglected to tell them one small detail. The location of the safe deposit box. She had moved several times, and they didn't even know where to start, which bank, at which branch, or address, or even which town. And even if they had known where to look for the box, they would have been in for a shock. The papers that would have authorized them to look inside were locked in the box itself. So planning ahead can really make all the difference to your family. And just so you know, typically the executor or the successor trustee will have access to the safe deposit box, but not until they have a certified copy of the death certificate. And so it's for this reason it's best not to store documents or assets that your survivors are going to need within the first four to six weeks after death. Number seven are tax returns. Now, keeping previous year's tax returns will act as a guide for your family when filing the final tax return after death. I mean, most people now just keep electronic copies of their tax returns on their computer or sometimes on their CPA's company portal. Wherever you keep them, just make sure you document the location. Now, the length of time that you should keep tax returns varies, but to be safe, I would keep seven years on file. Number eight, password and PIN numbers. Password and PIN numbers for your online accounts or the location where they can be found. I mean, most of us have an online identity, right? We have email accounts, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. We have online banking, digital photo storage, frequent flyer miles. I mean, that's just to name a few. For each account, write down the username, the password, and the PIN numbers. Now, for security purposes, these PINs and passwords should be safeguarded. You may have these on a password-protected spreadsheet already or in some software application. There are many of them out there. Just make sure that you document in the family legacy drawer where that information can be found. One example is um, Facebook. I don't know if 
many of you know that your Facebook account remains active um, long after your death. And sometimes this can be very distressing to family members when they see birthdays and other information pop up in the news feed. But you can direct Facebook in advance whether you want to have your account memorialized or deleted permanently. And I'm going to tell you how to do this. So if you have a Facebook account and you want to make that direction ahead of time, just go to Facebook and go to your settings, and then security, and then legacy contact, and then follow the prompts. So settings, security, legacy contact. Number nine, funeral instructions and people to call. If you've ever had to plan a funeral or a memorial service for a loved one, you know how difficult it could be. Family and friends want to honor the person who has died, but they might not agree on how. And decisions usually have to be made much more quickly than we're inclined to act at a time of grief. Documenting your wishes for funeral and memorial services will provide tremendous relief for your loved ones, heading off potential disputes and relieving confusion. So some basic um, concerns you may want to address here is, do you want a burial or do you want a cremation? Where do you want your services to take place? Who are the pastors and participants that you want involved in the ceremony? Is there specific music you want? What are your preferences for a eulogy? Do you have favorite flowers? Or how do you want memorial donations to be directed? You know, I'm so thankful that my mom had her final wishes clearly documented. She had her entire memorial service written down, down to the, the dress and the jewelry that she wanted to be buried in. <laughs> she even had written that she wanted to be buried with her favorite Bible open up to a specific verse. My sister and I only had to make arrangements because she made all the decisions. Also important is a listing of the names and phone numbers of the people that should be notified in the event of your death. In addition to family and friends, be sure to include people such as your attorney or your accountant, financial advisor, an insurance broker. Number 10. Now this is a three-prong answer here. Family tree, photographs, and heirlooms. Family tree, photographs, and heirlooms. You know, the importance of tracing and documenting your family tree is truly about preserving your heritage. It gives your family a sense of where they came from, the places their ancestors had lived, and the events that impacted their lives. There are many online software programs that you can use to search and to create a family tree. I mean, who knows, you may contact a long-lost cousin as a side benefit to this task. Family photographs also hold an important significance. Be certain that you're writing names and dates and events on the back of the pictures. Go through pictures with your parents and your grandparents. Document stories and, and preserve the photographs for generations to come. My mom wrote on a, a back of a lot of pictures, in fact, this is the one after she had passed away I found. This is a picture of my grandparents' wedding in 1913. And she definitely wrote on the back, Ernest and Anna Bean, November 26, 1913, age 20 and 21. Family heirlooms are something that have been handed down through generations. It may be jewelry, it could be a painting, or maybe even a knick-knack object that doesn't necessarily have monetary value, but it has a family significance. Take a picture, write out the story or significance of the item. Be sure to disclose the location of the heirloom. It may be in the back of some storage shed or in deep in the crevices of your china cabinet, but you've got to make sure that you tell them where they are and the story behind it. I mean, this is my mother's. Uh, you know, it's just costume jewelry, but when I, and I like having it in my jewelry box, and I wear it every once in a while, but it reminds me of when I was a child looking at her pink jewelry box and seeing it laid out so beautifully. 
Now, be, uh, be specific as to who in your circle of family and friends should receive certain items you own. Create a listing and attach it to your will or trust document. You know, this is of critical importance. I have seen more family conflict over dividing up personal property than any other estate issue. Ask your children what items they would want, and then prepare that detailed list. Better yet, why don't you give some of the items to your children and family while you're still alive? What a joy that is to both the giver and the receiver. I just love the saying, do your giving while you're living so you're knowing where it's going. <laughs> Number 11 is spiritual legacy. What kind of legacy will you leave? Will you leave behind only tangible items like property and money and possessions? Or will you leave behind a faith legacy that is imperishable and eternal? You know, your spiritual legacy is like a baton and you, that you begin to pass to the next generation even while you're still alive. And your family can grab that baton and run with it now and long after your portion of the race is finished. I'm truly blessed by each day by my mom's faith legacy. When she passed away, I received her study Bible. Don't want to cry. <laughs> and during my study times, I love to stumble upon her notes in the margin and the underlines. It's priceless. Number 12 is ethical will and love letters. Ethical will and love letters. Now, the ethical will is a personal legacy document. While a traditional will gives instructions on how to pass on tangible property, the ethical will records and passes on personal values. And it's really an important part of your legacy. And you may want to include four important sections in your ethical will. Number one would be values. What values have you sought to live by and instill in your children? Number two would be life lessons. What have your life experiences taught you? Are there any particular principles that you want others to remember? Three would be memories. Are there stories that you want to share just to be sure that they're not lost? And future. What is your vision for the future, for your family, for your friends, even for your community? And how do you envision your beneficiaries to utilize the financial resources that you've entrusted to them? You know, there are many other items that you want to place in the family legacy drawer, and each family will customize to their own situation. Now, be sure to notify your family where your drawer is. <laughs> And be sure to keep it updated. You know, it might be a good time each year when you're gathering all of your tax documents for tax preparation, maybe you can just review your family legacy drawer to make sure that it's up to date. You know, I am in the process of writing a book and a workbook filing system that's both paper and digital. And the process, of course, is taking much longer than I anticipated, but I, have to, I plan to have it finished next spring. And you can go to my website. I have my web address at the bottom of that page. And sign up on the mailing list, and I will keep you updated. And you'll also find a blog on my site. And I write about every other week um, different um, items about the family legacy drawer. And I hope you can find that uh, information to be valuable. Um, since I don't have a book ready, and I know that a lot of you want to get started on this right away, Biola has this uh, Life and Legacy Planner, and this really would help you get started. And we're going to have this available out at the table out there after the event, and you can purchase this for $15, and it's just something that will really help you get started. Prompt you, if you've got the information there, this will prompt you to continue on with that. Also, my email address is at the bottom, and if you have any questions or comments about this, I would love to hear from you. I'll also be at the table afterwards to answer any questions. So I hope that you have found this information to be helpful in creating or adding to your family legacy drawer. It truly is the best gift 
you can give your family. Thank you. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.